Thank you for having us, everyone. Before we do we kick off, um, we do want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of Rome today, the Gadigal people of Eora Nation. Um, why we do that, I'm a gunner man, so my family's from east of Victoria, two and a half hours um, east of Melbourne, um, from a place called Lake Tyres. Um, and Bianca is, please talk for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, um, on my father's side I'm Camilla Ray Glassingy and that's in New South Wales and Victoria areas, so down here. And then on my mother's side I'm Balladon and Wadjuk and that's from WA, so it's in Perth and then also a couple of hours inland in Marion and Marion. So as you can tell it's two completely different sides of the country. Somehow they both met in Alice Springs in the middle, had my eldest sister moved down to Brisbane which is um, where I came and told home for 21 years of my life and now I have the privilege of being able to work, eat, sleep, love um, on Gadigal Country. So it's a privilege to be here today. So we, um, we know you've got, you've got to know where you come from before you know where you can go. Um, so for that we do want to acknowledge the traditional lands of Iran. Um, we're going to tell a little bit of a story. You're going to hear a lot about Bianca's story which is uh, on the rise. And then we want to tell you about the narrative um, of a mentoring which a lot of you in this room have been a part of. So we'll, um, we'll hit the screen and take it from there.
imagine yourself as a grade 12 high school student. You're a month away from graduating high school and you get called into the guidance counselor's office. The door opens, you sit down, and the guidance counselor asks you, so, what do you want to do after school? And you turn around, like the eager grade 12 student you are, and say, I want to go to university. And the guidance counselor turns to you and says, well, university is hard to get into. What else do you have in mind? Open your eyes. That was me just over four and a half years ago. I had teachers who were against me. I had peers that questioned my originality. And I had people that just really didn't want the best for me. Don't get me wrong, I had really big supporters that were around me and that was something that I think was the pivotal moment for me. I was able to go home and I had supportive parents who, although they both only finished high school in grade 10, they both went on to, to higher education and they both continued that pathway for us to follow when it came to education. They knew in order to have the best life for us as a family that education was the key and that was the point that we were able to, to walk down so that us as a family could grow together. There's a reason that they moved to Brisbane, there's a reason that I grew up in Brisbane, and that was, you know, to make sure that we had the best way of life. That was a bit of the difference when it came to growing up, because I know a lot of kids were getting told the exact same thing, but they might not be the sort of person to go to university, they might not be the sort of person um, to go down the path, you know, that they wanted to go down. And for me, you know, it was quite an interesting one, because when it came to 2010, when I walked into the AIM doors, both my sister and my mother became mentors of the AIM program, and I came into the program as a grade nine mentee. I walked into an environment that made me incredibly uncomfortable. It was a sort of thing where growing up, because I was always shut down with my imagining what was possible, and always getting told that I couldn't do what I wanted to do, I was very shy and I couldn't stand standing in front of people. If I was doing this eight years ago when I was grade nine, I'd be very, very scared, and quite nervous to be honest. So it was quite an interesting one because when I went into that room, everyone around me, whether they were older, whether they were the same age, they all wanted the best for me, they all wanted the best for each other. And we all had the same passions, we all wanted to do something. You know, whatever we wanted to do, that was possible and that was what the environment I was walking into. And for me, as a 15 year old kid, I walked in there and I thought, you know what, this is a place where I want to be, this is where I want to work when I'm older. It's quite interesting because a lot of 15 year olds don't walk into a workplace and think, oh, well, in an environment like this and, and think, you know, this is where I want to be. But I want to be another support mechanism for another Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kid. I want to be able to do that throughout my journey. So, went into university, did that for a couple of years, and in my second year, I was able to come on board as a worker at AIM in Brisbane. I tried about two or three times to get into this company, so it was quite a hard one. But at the same time, I knew I'd be the right person to come into it at one point in time. And from that moment, I was able to work with kids that I actually went to school with. I was able to work with kids that wanted to do whatever they wanted, and I wanted to be that person that would support them getting there. So after a couple of years in the program there, and as I was just about to walk across the stage last year when I graduated university, I was offered the opportunity to come on board as the co-CEO for 2018, which saw me moving down here to Sydney, saw me working with a whole bunch of new kids, a whole bunch of new people working on a country that um, I was welcomed into, which was incredible. Now moving forward and, and you know how we got here, what we do when it comes to AIM, we've done a lot on this journey, but there is so much more to go. And it's something that's going to be really incredible and that so many people are a part of already and so many more to come and continue. So what do we do? If we want to change the world, we have to change the way it works. Thank uh -huh.
maybe today. So, fools build barriers, wisdom builds bridges. And for the last 14 years, what we've done is build these bridges between university and high school between those university students that are on the way to the middle and upper class and between those kids here in Australia that are being left behind. Now the impact has been that we've been able to mobilise upwards of 7,000 university students to mentor close to 20,000 disadvantaged high school kids who are our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students here at home. The impact has been that our kids are transitioning through school at a higher rate than the rest of the population and then importantly gaining year 12 attainment and landing in a post-school successful pathway at parity. Now, what does that mean? For the cohort of 18 to 24 year old Indigenous high school kids, oh, sorry, for the cohort of 18 to 24 year olds of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, 40% of us are in post-school successful pathways. University, full-time employment, further training. Now for the other cohort of non-Indigenous people, that's 75%. For the last seven or eight years that we've been tracking our year 12's um, progression, they've gone 78%, 76%, 74%, 75%. And arguably changed and solved one of Australia's greatest challenges. Now, this year alone we're working with 10,000 kids across the country. The program's been so successful between those two controllable economic levers that it's been acquired overseas in Africa, in two campuses in South Africa, and in Kampala, Uganda. This program, this from what was once a program, was then quickly turned into a movement, has the cap capability to be one of the greatest revolutions of our time. We know that education is the key lever that ends disadvantage, so we're lifting up our most disadvantaged kids, we're giving them a shot, we're giving them an education, we're ending the cycle of disadvantage there. But the hidden sleeper is that we're mobilising masses of university students who are one day going to hold power. And in those formative years of their degrees, we're allowing, allowing them to cross that cultural and social divide and build understanding, trust, empathy, and show kindness to a group of people that they otherwise wouldn't have. Now, they're gonna take that DNA with them in five, 10, 15, 20 years time, and when they do hold power, they're gonna change the face of the planet, our country at home and the world abroad. Now this program is not just for Indigenous kids, it's between the two controllable economic leaders. We're also running it now down in Melbourne and we're working with African Australian kids. We know that change happens when you get off the, when you get off the fence and you do something. When you don't sit there and be passive or apathetic and allow things to carry on. You lead with vision, you be bold, and you come forward with solutions. Now we've got the most repeatable, scalable and cost effective solution to ending inequality on the planet. And next year, we're going to take it to America. We're bringing 200 college students out from the States, out here to Sydney, and we're going to hold the world's first festival of mentoring. And we're going to position it as Davos meets Coachella. The World Economic Forum, it's not funny. It's <laughs> seriously not funny. It's the world's biggest party. Those 200 college students are all people that have been born into disadvantage, but importantly, is their struggle, is their strength, as you said, Uncle, and made it out. They're going to come out to Oz, acquire the AIM DNA across three or four days, and then take it back home and run AIM as a student chapter in their local campus. They're going to mobilise 100 of their peers to mentor 100 disadvantaged high school kids, and off the back of that one flight, we're going to have 20,000 uni students mobilised to mentor 20,000 disadvantaged high school kids. We're going to put Australia on the map as innovators, as thought leaders, and importantly, we're going to change the narrative for Indigenous Australia too. What we're going to see over the following years is planes chartered into Australia from all around the world. We're going to bring thousands of university students out to Oz who want to change the planet, who want to do something and want to lead it, and we're going to skill them up to take on the DNA to go back home, mobilise their peers to mentor their most disadvantaged high school kids. If we do this really shit, we'll work with 500,000 kids in four years' time. If we do it really well, we'll work with a million onwards. What happens in Australia? We go from 10,000 kids to 20,000 kids. We get towards a critical mass, and we engage one quarter of the indigenous high school population. One quarter, 20,000 kids that you know are gonna go through school, that are gonna land in a post-school successful pathway. We go hard and fast at that for the next four or five years time, maybe the next 10 years time, guess what? We'll see the end of educational inequality for kids like me and Bianca, 
and we'll start to see this. We'll start to see 200 years align with 60,000 years. If we can end that in our lifetime, I guarantee it's something that we can all be proud of. If we want to change the world, as Bianca said, we've got to change the way it works. And uh, you better believe it that you've got the keys in your hand now. Don't be passive. Don't stand still. Fridays, you spend the whole week gearing up for them. For me, it's about actually doing the things which help me be present, to be settled and have a clear mind. Have some time and space in the morning so I'm not back to back, just, just rushed. who is ready to sit, be present, to be the best sounding board, the best role model, the best sense of support they can be for an individual student. I wouldn't miss a day of AIM. I'd be so sick and I'd be like, I'm going to AIM because it makes me happy to be here with these kids. You're mentoring kids, but like half the time you're getting more out of it. You're getting just as much out of it. They're helping you as much as you're helping them. It's really a two-way street. So my role as a centre manager is about facilitating a group of staff members and more importantly, a group of 200 mentors. All right, so our amazing super mentors will be arriving very soon. So let's run through there. There's quite a few logistics um, and backup plans in the Women of the South. My role is about firstly setting culture, monitoring performance, getting the best mentors and training them, and then engaging as many kids as possible. Activity time. This is quite intense in terms of logistics, but we're good at logistics. We also have a map from college girls. It can be helpful to know a bunch of frameworks and structures, but in the end, you need to be able to express yourself as a leader. That's your role. It's not much more complicated than that. Before nine, you get to say hi to all the other mentors, you'll get pretty psyched, and then you know it's getting the kids, getting the mentees, and trying to G them up for the day, seeing what they throw at you pretty much. It's always something new. Alright, good morning everyone. Welcome to our day four of AIM. So before we actually head down to our location today, we're gonna take a few moments to open up our folders and talk to our mentor about who we're wanting to mentor. I think underpinning AIM is high expectations. This year we ask kids to think about people in their life that they could mentor. That's a, that's a wonderful concept we get to break open an AIM, to say, hey, you're 15, but you're still capable of carrying a lot of these attitudes and values, like whether we can help people or whether we can engage in a leadership position. As a society, we need to start believing in 15 year olds that they're able to do this stuff and they want to do this stuff. It's coming into the uni for three modules in one day. These modules consist of three 20-minute blocks. 
we kick off with an AIM TV inspirational piece of content. These are often interviewed all around the world and they're offered to the kids within the first 20 minutes in what's called AIM TV. Where the rain comes down, tell me where will you be? Taika, welcome to AIM TV. Right. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Having me. I didn't start making films until I was 28. It's not the end of the world if you don't decide what you want to do for a job by the time you're 18. You know? People often will get the idea of success and wealth confused. And, you know, success is whatever you decide it to be. Second, we get an activity. So we get a chance to get into our mentoring dynamic. We sit with a kid and discuss the value being presented in that AMTV uh, in the prior 20 minutes. And we often do an activity to try to digest some of those kind of teachings. And that's where we get the mentoring relation really thriving. And I, and I can see the difference from the first day. When, yeah, oh yeah, I can see the difference. You're way more confident, you're a bit happier, it's great. What we did it on a very grassroots level this year is we actually got kids to tell their story on a piece of paper. We gave them a few helpful titles, like how to survive school, how to wrangle with your identity, gave them a bit of structure, and they went to town. I think one thing we've learned a lot at AIM is the more that we give away the power of storytelling and give away the power of mentoring to others, that's when it really starts to soar. The third 20 minutes, failure time. Failure time in a practical sense allows your mentors to meet with a group of mentees doing a particular activity and it might be pottery for 20 minutes. That activity occurs in one corner, another group of mentors with their mentees are doing another activity. We jump into the concept and we use a space in our brain which allows us to be comfortable not doing something right. Test out our skills and our bravery to try new things. So those three 20 minute blocks allow us to kind of capture an attentive audience for an hour and we'll do it again. One thing we did at AIM this year is that we asked the kids to dream up really brave goals and we're kind of sticking it to your conventional smart goals, uh, specific and measurable, we got them to think bold and write them down. Second to that we said if you want to achieve this goal, how about you set a sacrifice, something that you have to overcome and uh, withstand to achieve that goal. This is pretty much one of the final days we're having today, working with my mentee Nat, really setting in stone her progress, and I really got to see it all. And the coolest thing was that she like brought it up first to me, just through her own work. Um, today, you know, she realised and she came out being like, you know, I'm way more confident. I want to go to school. I think there's something within every single person that wants to get outside themselves and connect with someone else. It's a wonderful thing to be able to focus on someone else's life as opposed to your own little internal struggles or scene or achievements. You get to spend time, you know, kind of mixing it with different ages, different cultures, and I think it's a pretty exciting space to be in, I think. started off in 2005, just down the road at the University of Sydney, with working with Alex Park, Alex Park Community School, 25 high school kids in grade 9, 25 university mentors from New Zealand. And now we've been, been able to work with over 15,000 kids across the country, 7,000 mentors also across the country. And we've been able to scale it to 18 universities. This thing works. We've been able to deliver a model that has been able to work with the most disadvantaged peoples in the world. It's something that we hold very proudly, and it's something that I've come through, that many other kids have come through, and it's been able to work for us, so why can't it work for others? There's so much that we can be doing already, and there's so much more to, to happen in the future. And it's something that I'm very proud of when it comes to working here at home and being able to deliver the stuff that we get to deliver. 
I'm going to keep this super short. But I want to say, uh, reiterate a couple of things that we've been talking about lately. From working with those 25 kids to having worked with 15,000 over in the country, it started off as a program. It's turned now into a movement. And it now has the opportunity to become the biggest and greatest revolution that the world has seen coming out of universities born from the oldest of agriculture in the world. That's something that we can be proud of as Australians. It's something that we can be leading across the world. And it's something that I can't wait to be able to see. So that in my lifetime, we'll see the tail end of Indigenous and educational inequality in the country. In order for us to change the world, we have to change the way it works. two guys with crazy haircuts of opposite sides of the world <laughs> starting at each other, but, but people like you doing what you're doing, there's always hope, isn't there? Certainly as someone who's a South African native, I'm hugely excited about what you guys are doing. And um, I'm going to try, I'd love to become a mentor, talk to you often. <laughs> um, we're running a bit ahead of time, which is great. So what I'd, I'd like you guys to do right now, you may see there's a, a blank piece of paper in front of you. Can you think about one thing that you'd like to get out of your time spent at the symposium today and tomorrow? Could be anything. Could be some questions or answers. Could be to network. Um, it's probably different for everyone. Can you write that down on that piece of paper? And at some point during the proceedings, we will address some of those and hopefully get some interactive dialogue happening. So I'll give you a minute or two to do that. Just one thing, if you want to put more than one, go for it. Thank you for that, it was great. Um, you've got a room of people here that are in great positions in universities. Can you talk a little bit about how you go building a relationship with the universities, perhaps even the ones that you're not working with at the moment? Who do you talk to? How does that play out? Yeah. So generally, um, we always go to university leadership. Um, whenever it comes to movements and making an impact in any place, I think you have to have leadership running that. Um, so we always either go to the Chancellor or DBC um, in that sort of space, but then also working with the Indigenous um, officers because a lot of the time they have um, Indigenous here in every university across the country, so working with them. And then the way that we build traction through the university um, students is through faculties. So we utilise pretty much the holistic view of the university to try and get as much sort of backing from leadership so that everyone else um, within the ranks can go, go through the program. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Yeah. Um, what can, what's, if you have to say one thing that you would like us to do after your presentation, we're inspired to take that as <laughs> We're like, um, if there's one thing you wanted us to do when we go back to our university, what would it be? I mean, for me personally, um, I know this thing works, and if it can work for it, where people from the University of Sydney to the Bro University to the University of Victoria can work in any, any university. So I would say to get amongst what we do, um, we 
you know, if you want to be a part of making history and supporting the next generation of Indigenous leadership um, throughout the country and supporting the most disadvantaged kids in the, in the country as well, come to us and we can do it. Hi Bianca, uh, thanks for a very inspiring presentation. Chris from CPU, we're at our university. Yes. Uh, I had a question just about the festival of mentoring yes. next year. Is there a way that AIM universities can contribute to that in some way or add some value? That's a good question actually. Um, and that's something that I'll, I might get my CEO to directly answer if that's okay. Yeah, right, cool. Yeah. But the university is here, yeah, definitely. It's going to be based out of the University of Sydney, so um, where it's starting. How are you funded? How are we funded? Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a mix. So we've got um, mostly partnerships, so corporate partnerships, universities, schools, um, and then federal government. So it's a mix. And philanthropists. Sorry. Right. I think our program is funded by a philanthropy through a, a mining company that has a, an engagement with our indigenous students. Yeah. I was going to say that the lady asked the question there, why do you think it's um, a response would be that they, the universities build a relationship with their own Yeah, and that's definitely, um, yeah, for sure. And I think whenever we come into the AIM program, we, we make sure that we consult with local indigenous communities because realistically, at the same time, as much as AIM works, it might not work for that community. Um, so ensuring that whatever is best for that community is, is done. So yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, yeah, well, uh, well, what's, what's been the most challenging part of, of getting the program up? You said it, it, it started with the program, and now it's a movement, and talking about the festival of mentoring, what, what really big plans. Yeah. Well, what, what's been the hardest thing so far? And what do you think is the, the biggest challenge of the future? Yeah, so I think the hardest thing so far has been getting the traction. Um, we can start growing for at least three to four years. Um, the first step out of the out of Sydney was in Wollongong, um, and then after that was Queensland. So it took a little while for us to kind of gain traction. And then once it kind of started working, and then we were getting our cohorts through from grade nine to grade twelve. Um, the whole reason it started with the grade nine students at Alex Park was the fact that that was a really high dropout rate. Yeah. Um, so kids weren't actually going into grade ten. So that was an important part was to make sure that they were going not only into grade ten but to eleven and twelve. So the more that we normalise the fact of our kids going to so that, like I said earlier, my parents only went to grade 10 and their parents went to around grade 4, grade 6. Um, so now it's a normal thing most of the time for kids to be going to year 12. But for me, when I was going into grade 12, it wasn't like, you know, the next step wasn't university, it was meant to be something else, not work. Um, so yeah, that was probably the biggest challenge was gaining traction, whereas now we've got a lot of kind of, we've been able to build that movement across the country. Um, and then moving forward, it's just, that's a good question. Um, I, I can't give a, a direct answer to it, um, but it really just depends on you know where we want to go in those years. Like we want to we want to hit twenty thousand kids by twenty twenty two. So um, ensuring that we can actually get to more communities is our biggest thing. That's what we do a lot of outreach programs. Hardest challenge is the fact that we build ourselves off universities, which means that you know not a lot of communities have universities. Um, it's mainly in major cities and, and stuff. So that's. A big challenge for us, so getting us out to the community is the hardest one. So, so if I understand that correctly, then you, you sort of scaled the first thing, the hardest part was getting sort of entered and then scaling it up. And it sounds like you, you want to get bigger and, yeah. and reach more people and, and transform more people's lives. Yes. Yeah, correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll just add something to that. I'm going to be like, the founder Jack Manny Bancroft's book, The Mentor, but that really tells the story of the start of this project, and it really was, to answer your question, Chris, um, is sheer determination to stick with this, because it was really, really hard going. And, um, most people's default mode is to think that the status quo is what it is, and we can't change it. And he stuck with it through you know, incredibly long period of time trying to bring universities on board and a lot of people in the room understand that requires infinite patience and in this case living off the snow on the rack for a long, long time. 
So, um, you know, where they've gotten to now is, uh, you know, it's, it's been a better part of 15 years to get to the point where they might be able to do what they're talking about doing, which I think is, is, is amazing. It's been, you know, been a big transition for them is that it's not all about founder and more. It's planted on seeds. They stuck with it long enough that people have said, okay, well, you know, maybe there is something here. Uh, and I think the best part about this is, is the whole idea of um, building on the, the energy and idealism of university students because they're the ones who haven't been jaded yet <laughs> and who haven't um, gone into the working world and started down that path of, of you know, all the things that box us in So I think you know, it's, it's a great, great story. And, um, you know, uh, um, geez, 10% of what you described that would be a little fun. Yeah. No, I agree. I think it's um, quite interesting because when I when I came into the program eight years ago, I think we only saw up to a thousand kids across the country, like in those three spots seeing the program. So like over its growth, I've been able to see that. And then to now, it was something that I wouldn't have been able to imagine. But, but you know, the fact that we stuck to it and now we're here, um, it's quite incredible.